factors if you think about it. Um, and, and this one is sucking on the flower buds of the milkweed. So every part of the plant is used by some kind of insect. Uh, even the insides of the leaves, these um, blotchy patches here are called leaf mines. Uh, they're the work of leaf mining insects, which are larvae that feed uh, on the green tissue between the epidermal layers. So under the skin of the leaf and the patches are where they've excavated, where they've removed some of the green tissue and eaten it. And all this brown stuff is their poop, which is known as frass. Um, the larvae that uh, specialize on milkweed grow up to be these little two millimeter yellow flies. Um, and leaf miners will be a recurring theme in this talk because I've spent the past decade uh, compiling all the information I could find about leaf miners to create this complete guide to leaf miners of North America. There are several hundred species of leaf mining flies. There are also over a thousand species of leaf mining moths in 40 different families. Uh, there are just over 200 species of leaf mining beetles in North America and about 40 leaf mining sawflies, which are kind of wasp-like things. And this um, currently exists only in digital form because it's almost 2,000 pages and because I can't stop uh, updating and revising it. But recently, someone in South Carolina printed the whole thing out and sent me a picture with my other book for scale <laughs> just to show me what it looked like. So not something you'd want to carry around with you. Um, anyway, those are just uh, some of the bugs that depend on milkweed. But every other native plant has a whole suite of insects that are similarly dependent on it uh, for survival. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, talking about um, some of the other native plants around here. And specifically, uh, all of the plants I'm going to talk about have just shown up in my yard uh, of their own accord, and all I had to do was not mow it. <laughs> so this is um, what our yard looked like in the summer of 2013 when Julia and I first moved here. I'll just show you a, a quick series of before and after shots. So it was just completely blank lawn with an arborvitae hedge. And now we've planted uh, fruit trees and there's a, a vegetable garden here with a grape arbor, little strawberry patches. We planted some perennials along the driveway, but all of the interstitial space is just wild, unkempt meadow with little walking paths mowed among them. Another view of the front yard. Uh, this is what it looked like as of two years ago. The backyard with just the beginnings of our first little vegetable garden and compost pile there. Uh, now with rows of raspberries and some peach trees here, a hoop house and big vegetable garden and then goldenrod and all kinds of other plants uh, in between. Then back to the far corner of the front yard before and after. Uh, you can see some solar panels in the corner there. Um, the, the only trees in the yard when we moved here were this one cherry tree by the shed and this old apple tree. Um, we were just starting to put together a chicken house there. Uh, this is what it looks like now with a fence to keep out the, the bobcats and coyotes and raccoons and such. Um, and then the backyard. Um, this is the view from the chicken enclosure with all the meadow between there and the vegetable garden. And uh, one of the plants that has come up in those interstitial spaces in great abundance is milkweed. It's not something we had to plant. It just, it gets around really well on those airborne fluffy seeds and is well adapted to seeding into meadows. Um, and not just in those interstitial spaces, but here it is coming up in our asparagus patch and in our uh, strawberry patch. So it really is a weed <laughs> in some ways, and uh, we let the bugs have the milkweed between our um, our fruit and vegetable patches. But what's what's in the where we're trying to grow food, we pull it up, and then we uh, cook that up and get to eat it ourselves. It's actually delicious and nutritious if you um, just take the young shoots and boil them for seven minutes to neutralize uh, the toxins. But this talk is about what bugs eat, so. Back to 
uh, the other plants. Um, so the very first plant, a uh, wildflower that popped up and bloomed in our yard um, after we moved in was this daisy fleabane here. And I, as soon as I saw it, I ran over to it to see what uh, leaf mines I could see on it. And this one individual plant had three different types of leaf mines on it. Uh, one of them was this blotchy yellowish mine that I recognized as the work of this little moth, Perectopa plantaginicella. Most of these things don't have common names. So just have to live with that. <laughs> um, uh, these linear mines I recognized as the work of a, an agromized fly uh, because the flies have this characteristic way of feeding rather than belly up or lying on their backs. They lie on their sides and poop along one side and then they periodically roll over and poop on the other side. So you get this distinctive pattern of alternating broken dashes in their mines. These little yellow blobs are the larvae. And when I collected this and stuck it in a vial, a few days later, the larvae popped out and formed these shiny black puparia. And the adults that emerged, um, I, I send all of my leaf mining fly specimens to this uh, Canadian who specializes in these leaf mining flies. And he's been helping me identify them all and describe the new species like this one, which turned out to be new to science. Um, we named it Phytomyza erigeronis. Um, erigeron is the genus of daisy fleabane. Um, he and I have discovered over 60 new species uh, in the past three years, not all from my yard, but some of them. You'll meet a couple others later. <laughs> uh, but the third mine on that one daisy fleabane plant uh, was this elongate, very clean looking mine along the midrib that I didn't recognize at all. So I stuck that in a vial and uh, there was a little caterpillar inside that munched away and its mine continued to look very clean. And the reason for that I learned was that it was neatly piling all of its poop in a little heap just outside the entrance to its mine. And uh, after a few weeks, this adult moth emerged. And this belongs to a group that's really poorly known. And no one is really working on studying it right now. And this may also be a new species, but it might take a while <laughs> before I get a determination on that. Uh, another plant that came up pretty quick um, when, when we stopped mowing or never started mowing our lawn uh, was uh, evening primrose. There's a bunch of it right along the driveway. Um, and it, uh, true to its name, the flowers mostly open up in the evening. But one day when I was walking to get the uh, mail, I saw these amazing uh, bright pink moths just hanging out on the flowers. Uh, so when I, after I got the mail, I ran back in and Googled pink evening primrose moth and very quickly learned the name of this moth, which the common name is just primrose moth. But I also, once you have an insect's name, you can learn about its life cycle. And I read that th their caterpillars feed in the uh, flower buds of evening primrose. So every day for the next few weeks, as I was getting the mail, I would check the, the flowers right around the mailbox to see if I could spot a caterpillar and one day uh, oh yeah, there's another picture of one. <laughs> but uh, one day, uh, sure enough, there was this little caterpillar right by the mailbox with its head buried in the flower bud and m turning the petals to mushy goo coming out the other end. And I looked around and there are several more nibbled flower buds. And in some cases they were nibbling on um, dead uh, old flowers that were attached, still attached to the developing fruits. There's also um, a leaf miner on evening primrose um, in the genus Mompha. This is a moth genus. And I know a micro moth specialist in Illinois who is uh, specializing in particular on this genus. And he asked me if I could get him some adult specimens for him. So I collected some leaves uh, to raise them for him. Um, and uh, within a few days, these larvae popped out and spun cocoons and I was able to get some adults. And these, I haven't mentioned anything about size, but most of these leaf mining moths are between three and five millimeters long, so pretty tiny. Um, but 
while I was waiting for these moths to emerge from their cocoons, I noticed some other things had started to nibble the leaves in this little vial. And I uh, examined the leaves to see what was doing that. Here's the little moth uh, hanging out at the edge of the leaf. Um, but this big hole here, I uh, noticed this big pile of soupy poop at the edge of it. And I took a closer look at that and realized that this was a larva that had just piled all of its poop on its back. This side view here, you can see its little face a little bit. Uh, but I had no idea what this was, but I let it keep eating and eventually it um, scraped off all of that poop from its back and made its cocoon out of that. And then once it pupated, I realized it had this long snout, so it must be some kind of weevil. And when it emerged, it was a weevil I recognized. Um, this is its name is Deepsella zimmermanii, <laughs> um, but it's, I had seen these weevils nibbling little holes in evening primrose leaves, but uh, no one knew what the, the larvae of this species looked like or what they did for a living. Um, and then in, in that same leaf, there was, in addition to the holes, that the, there are two of those weevil larvae munching those holes, but I also noticed this other kind of feeding sign which is called window feeding, where instead of eating holes all the way through the leaf, the insect um, munches on one surface but leaves a, a window of intact epidermis on the, the other, the opposite side of the leaf. So I looked around to see who was doing that and found this little larva, which I recognized as a, a flea beetle larva. And I knew those need to burrow into soil to pupate. So I dropped it in a little uh, baby food jar with an inch of soil in it and it burrowed right down. And a few weeks later, this shiny gold flea beetle emerged. And I sent this to a, a leaf beetle specialist and he told me, uh, he identified it as a species that had been named just like a decade earlier and no one knew what its host plant was or what its larvae did. So many new discoveries to be made <laughs> right along the driveway. Um, and here's another one on evening primrose. I showed you that one leaf miner uh, that made that linear mine in evening primrose leaves. That was the only known leaf miner on evening primrose. So when I saw these caterpillars making these big blotch mines with all the frass uh, heaped neatly at one end, I knew I had something different. So I collected these to see what would, they would turn into. Uh, they had a similar reddish larvae that came out to spin cocoons but their adults were totally different. Um, and this uh, was another species that had a name, but no known it, uh, host plants or immature stages. So this one, uh, Aristotelia isopelta is the name of that moth. Okay, so, so far I've shown um, some plants with nice flowers that maybe not everyone would consider weeds. Uh, most people don't like having stinging nettle around there in their yards, but we love it because it's, um, it's, it's actually, it's another plant that's really delicious and nutritious if you cook it up for a little bit. It's also medicinal that helps with allergies. So we have some that popped up right by the front door um, that we've allowed to grow there. And one day when I was sitting on the front stoop, I noticed this lovely little egg on one of the leaves. And I recognize this as the egg of a butterfly that, whose caterpillars specialize in eating st uh, stinging nettle leaves. And th the caterpillars aren't uh, very conspicuous because they're usually hidden in leaves that they've uh, tied with silk to make little shelters that they live inside. Uh, but here is a chrysalis that I found among some folded leaves. And the adults are known as red admirals, and they, like monarchs and large milkweed bugs, fly south for the winter. Um, ragweed, another unpopular plant because it's a lot of people are allergic to it. Um, this particular leaf uh, happens to have some leaf mining fly mines, but I don't need to talk about those. <laughs> what I wanted to mention about the ragweed is these fancy uh, fruit flies that specialize on it. The females lay their eggs in the female flowers of ragweed and their larvae um, feed on the developing uh, seeds. 
and the males um, hang out just waving their fancy wings around, um, staking out territories on the plants and trying to attract mates. There are also some beetles that specialize in eating ragweed leaves. Um, these lay their eggs in big clusters on the upper sides of the leaves. And the caterpillars are these little fuzzy things, which uh, unlike almost all beetles uh, burrow into soil or at least go under leaf litter to pupate, but these spin their cocoons right on the surfaces of the leaves. So that's um, kind of different. Uh, goldenrod is another plant that's come up all over our yard. Um, here, just for scale, I'm standing, uh, this is my face, uh, in a little patch of goldenrod right in our front yard. Um, and there, there, I could do a whole slideshow on things that eat goldenrod, but I'll show you just a few here. Uh, this is uh, the spring before last, I noticed a few uh, goldenrod stems that were neatly cut, uh, maybe eight inches above the ground. There's a third one there. Um, it's a very neat beveled cut, and I could see there was a, a hole going down into it that was plugged with uh, sawdust, basically. So I cut it lengthwise and saw that there was this tunnel going all the way down to the ground. So I figured there must be something that it was overwintering in the roots of the plant. So I dug up a little chunk um, of the lawn and stuck it in a clear garbage bag in the front hall. And I waited to see what would come out. And over the next month, uh, 30 different kinds of insects appeared in this bag. And I did a whole blog post on all of the, the life in a cubic foot of my lawn. But finally, after a month, um, the things that had cut the stems appeared. There were three of these uh, plume moths that look like the letter T. <laughs> um, here's one uh, peeking out of one of the rearing containers. Um, so, so that was a neat to learn about those. Uh, a more conspicuous uh, bug sign on uh, goldenrod stems are these big spherical galls. A gall is a deformity in a plant that is caused by another organism living inside it. And um, usually that organism is an insect, but there are also fungus galls and mite galls. A few other things cause galls. Um, and it's kind of mysterious how um, insects trick plants into making these things around them, but it's some combination of uh, me mechanical manipulation and uh, chemical um, manipulation. And, and somehow they're, in some cases, they're maybe actually inserting uh, like genetic engineering somehow, but in, in most cases, they seem to be turning on latent genes that are already in the plant and making them do things they wouldn't normally do. So anyway, these spherical galls on goldenrod stems are caused by uh, fly larvae. And the larvae overwinter in those gulls, and you can often see holes where birds uh, have pecked to get out the larva. Um, and these really neat holes in the gulls are made by downy woodpeckers. Uh, and the way they find the larva is that the larva has spent its whole life feeding in the central cell in the gull, but then they, uh, this, this is a gull that had a woodpecker hole in it that I cut open. Um, that when, when the larva is done feeding, it chews this tunnel right to this, just below the surface of the skin of the gull, and then it waits out the, the rest of the winter there. And the reason it does that is the adult fly uh, won't have chewing mouth parts to chew its way out of the gull, so it has to situate itself so it's ready to pop out um, uh, in the spring after it pupates. And the, the way it's able to pop through the epidermis of the plant is that the, there's this balloon that pops out of the fly's forehead um, right when it's ready to emerge from its pupa. And then that shrinks back. It's this airbag that shrinks back into its face and never comes out again for the rest of its life. It, this is the little suture that that balloon came out of. 
Um, I don't know how they come up with this stuff, <laughs> but uh, these flies are about the size of deer flies and have similarly patterned wings. This is the hole that fly came out of. Um, but they have these conical, or the females have these conical ovipositor sheaths, and they have little piercing ovipositors that come out to insert their eggs into the plant stems. There are some kind of similar looking galls um, that are caused by moths rather than flies. And the way you can recognize those is the caterpillar um, chews uh, an, an exit hole at the top of the gall and then plugs it with frass. And um, because the adult moth, like the adult fly, it won't have chewing mouth parts to, to escape the gall. Usually these galls are more uh, long and uh, spindle shaped or elliptical like this one. And in the winter, that frass plugged hole is empty because these moths emerge in the fall and then they lay eggs around the base of the plant and that's how they overwinter. This is what the adult gall moth looks like. Uh, a beautiful caterpillar that you can see on uh, both uh, goldenrods and asters is this one. It's called the brown hooded brown hooded owlet moth. And I don't really know much about it besides that it's just always a treat to see them. <laughs> um, the adults are a little less spectacular, but that's what they look like. This is something else that can be found on both goldenrods and asters. Um, a caterpillar that tucks several uh, bunches of leaves into a continuous it makes a continuous tunnel by tying all these leaves together with silk. Um, and I'd seen this several times and didn't know what did it. So I cut this whole thing off and stuck it in a jar. Um, and this caterpillar wandered out eventually and spun a cocoon. And this is the adult, uh, another thing without a common name, but uh, Dicomerus okra palpella or something like that. <laughs> um, this is the flower of the plant that I raised it from. It's called smooth aster. And uh, some of this smooth aster uh, was the host plant for another fly that uh, I got to name a few years ago, um, Ophiomaya parda. Parda is the Latin name for leopard. And that's a reference to these um, spots of poop scattered throughout the mine, spotted like a leopard. Um, but uh, another distinctive thing about this leaf miner is that the mine appears empty um, when, the, when the larva is done feeding. Uh, it seems to end right here, but actually the larva uh, continues mining for a few more centimeters on the underside of the leaf, and then it forms this little bluish green puparium right at the edge of the leaf. And that's what the adult fly looks like. Um, that particular fly came from a, a smooth aster that was right here. Uh, so this is me celebrating uh, our solar panels first generation of a kilowatt hour on the, the day we first switched it on. But uh, that fly appeared the next year after there was more vegetation here. But um, also in this picture, that, that uh, daisy fleabane fly that I showed you earlier came from right here at the left edge of the screen. So that's two new species in one little picture there. Um, so you don't have to go far to discover new things, that's for sure. But um, there's another uh, new fly that looks almost exactly like that last one, but this one came from the opposite corner of the yard. And this one, as far as we can tell, feeds only on grass-leaved goldenrod, uh, Euphemia graminifolia. So we named it Ophiomaya euphemii. And this does the opposite of what Ophiomaya parda does. It mostly mines on the underside of the leaf, and then it switches to the upper surface and mines a little bit more and makes a black puparium there. So these, in addition to being very specific in what they eat, these leaf miners are all very specific in how they mine. Uh, so now I'll move on to some woody plants. This is a wild grapevine that was growing along our driveway. Um, it's riddled with holes of Japanese beetles, which obviously are 
not native insects and they aren't particularly host specific either. Uh, but among all these uh, beetle hole riddled leaves, I noticed uh, some slightly different feeding sign, some munching along the edge of a leaf. So I flipped that leaf over and saw this neat little caterpillar on the underside. And I looked over at another leaf with similar feeding sign and found a larger example of the same thing, just a beautiful stripy caterpillar. And these are uh, the immature stages of this moth, which I think is called the beautiful wood nymph or something like that. It's a bird poop mimic, but kind of beautiful at the same time. I don't know how they pull that off. Um, and I'll just show you one of my favorite uh, grape leaf miners. Um, here's the little caterpillar inside a backlit leaf. When it's finished feeding, the, the empty mine has this perfect oval hole cut out. And the way that happens is uh, the larva cuts that out to form its pupal case and they drop down on a strand of silk wearing this little hole punch. And they're known as shield bearer moths because of this. This one was hanging over my driveway and I again encountered it on my way to get the mail one day. Um, but they eventually hit the ground and they walk along wearing that like a turtle shell. This larva has shrunk its head back into its case, but eventually they attach that to some object and then the adult moth emerges uh, the following year in the case of this species. But this is what the adult moth looks like. And this moth has a relative that um, forms galls along these little lumpy flat galls along the veins of grape leaves. But the mature larva does the same thing as its leaf mining relatives that each one cuts out a little oval piece and then wanders off wearing a little gall burrito <laughs> looking for a place to make its uh, to pupate and overwinter. There uh, are many more conspicuous galls on grapes that are all caused by gall midges, which are little mosquito-like insects. And by some, uh, once a Canadian study a few years ago estimated that, I don't remember the total number of gall midge species they came up with, but basically one in five species of animals in the world is a gall midge according to this study. So there are many, many gall midges, uh, most of which don't have names yet. But this particular grape gall midge uh, does have a name. And the, the larvae, when they're done feeding, they pop out of these little succulent galls. They're bright orange. They burrow into the ground. And these orange adults can emerge a few weeks later or the following year, or sometimes several years later. They kind of hedge their bets a little bit that way. Uh, spice bush is a plant that um, birds have planted spice bushes around the edges of our yard. And we planted a few of our own right along the side of the house because uh, they're nice ornamentals. Um, and um, within a couple of years of our planting them, um, there started to be these neatly folded leaves. And if you see a neatly folded spice bush leaf, it's worth taking a peek inside because you'll see this big green caterpillar with big fake snake eyes on one end. Uh, this is the actual head up here. And these, I don't have a picture of this for this species, but they even have a fake snake tongue that po uh, pops out right about. Uh, somewhere on the top there, if you poke them just right. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, effective disguise. Um, but th the way this caterpillar is folding the leaf is by spinning uh, this bed of very fine silk back and forth across the top of it. And as the silk dries, it contracts and pulls the leaf inward until it's totally folded in half. And this is a leaf that has been abandoned by its caterpillar, but you can still see all the, the shiny silk in there. But uh, the younger uh, caterpillars of this species still have the fake eyes, but they look like bird poop. A lot of insects like to mimic bird poop because <laughs> nothing wants to eat bird poop, I guess. Uh, but this is a caterpillar of the spice bush swallowtail, and there's the adult.
but it's not the only caterpillar that makes leaf shelters on spice bushes. Um, these leaf shelters um, have uh, are holding cocoons that have pupae that are overwintering inside them. And these are um, made by the caterpillar of the spice bush silk moth, um, which the reason they stay attached to the twig all winter long is the caterpillar has wound silk around the leaf stalk and around the stem. So when the leaf tries to drop off in the fall, it's still attached by the silk. Uh, but this is what the caterpillar looks like. And their spice bush silk moth is just one name for it because it's actually uh, different populations have different food preferences. So there are some in our yard that feed on uh, cherry leaves and on uh, this little tulip tree we planted. But in, um, a little further south, they mostly eat spice bush and sassafras. Um, but another name for this moth is the Promethea moth. It's one of the giant silk moths. And well, you can see how big it is there. So the same family as the Luna moth. That's the best known uh, giant silk moth. Uh, sumac um, is a great plant to have around because it has these fuzzy red fruits that stay on all through the winter and even into April or so. And we have bluebirds and pileated woodpeckers and other birds that come to munch on these berries all through the winter. Um, there's a, a leaf roller that lives on sumac that um, has this gorgeous adult. It's just called the sumac leaf roller moth. <laughs> That's what it does. <laughs> there are galls on sumac that are uh, not caused by flies or by midges. Um, and they sometimes can be really numerous and sometimes they turn red and kind of look like little apples. But if you break them open, they're chock full of aphids, which is what is causing the galls. And these are not aphids that will be pests on any garden plants. They only feed on sumac all through the growing season. And then in the fall, uh, they sprout wings and they fly to mosses and that they hang out on moss all winter long. A lot of aphids have these strange two-part life cycles where they're on two totally unrelated plants in different parts of the year. Uh, another neat thing about sumac is that it has a pithy center that various insects bore into uh, to make their nests. And uh, Julia and I cut a bunch of sumac twigs to make our pea trellis out of one year. And then I remembered that, that some things like to nest in the pith. So I went and checked our pea trellis and every single stake had a little hole in the top. And it was hard to get a picture of, but this little shiny green thing here is the face of a bee peeking out. Um, these are called small carpenter bees. And uh, the following spring, I cut open some of the stakes to see, just to look at what the structure of the nest was inside. We just had them discarded in a pile at the edge of the garden. And each one um, had a, an adult bee uh, hanging out inside. And it turns out these overwinter as adults um, in the same kinds of places they make their nests in. But because these, oh, and sometimes there would be other things uh, inside the, their the abandoned nests with them. Like I think this was a jumping spider that had made a little silk retreat to ride out the winter there. But because these overwinter as adults, they're some of the first bees to emerge in the spring. And so they visit some of the spring ephemerals like this blood root we planted right in front of our house. Uh, arrowwood, I'm, I'm going to uh, leave my yard for a moment here to talk about this uh, neat moth we found on Nantucket. Um, we've spent the past decade doing gall and leaf mine surveys of Nantucket sponsored by the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative. And there's this one species of leaf miner that it took us five years to figure out its life cycle, which I'll just briefly summarize here. It's sometime in July, it lays an egg right about there in this case, and the larva starts out making this long squiggly mine, but then it eventually follows the midrib and petiole um, down into the stem. This is what the larva looks like at, at that point. Um, but it continues down the stem as a stem miner, um, 
where it feeds until the following June, at which point, and, and usually its stem mines aren't externally visible, but that was a, a rare example where you can see its trail in the bark. Um, but then um, it, in sometime in June, it cuts out a little flap in the bark at the edge of its mine, and it spins its cocoon on the underside of that flap. So once we, after five years, <laughs> figured that out, um, we came back one more time and spent about five hours just looking at arrowwood plants and collecting these little bark flaps. We found about 30 of them and ended up getting three adult moths out of those bark flaps. And um, that turned out to be a new species that I named Marmara viburnella with uh, Don Davis, who's been studying moths in this family at the Smithsonian since the 1960s. It's still at it. Um, but just last year, um, I, last year, because I wasn't traveling much, I decided to do a complete inventory of the leaf miners of my yard. And I found um, 212 different species, I think, but one of them was Marmara viburnella on this viburnum that a bird had planted at the edge of our yard. So there's the little, uh, the egg was laid here, it went squiggling along into the petiole, came back for a second, but then went back down the petiole. You can see the mine going down the petiole and then wrapping around the stem and on down the stem. And it's presumably still in that stem now. Uh, and sometime in June, we'll spin its cocoon. Uh, one other viburnum feeding caterpillar I encountered when I was trying to raise those leaf miners uh, was this hornworm, which turns out to be the larva of the hummingbird moth a common visitor to bee balm and other flowers. A meadow sweet is a great flowering shrub that has showed up at the corner of our yard. And um, so this leaf is one I found on a meadow sweet um, and the, the power line corridor that's a short walk from our house. This is a leaf miner that's uh, makes a little mine and then walks to the other side of the leaf and ties it down with silk and finishes feeding there. And what's interesting about this one is it was described from maybe one specimen in British Columbia like a hundred years ago and that no one ever uh, found it again until that one I found <laughs> under the power lines in Northfield. Um, but what I mainly wanted to say about the meadow suite <laughs> was um, there are so many bugs uh, that, that come to these flowers. And uh, when a lot of times people talk about pollinator habitat as if it just means planting flowers for bugs to come to. But all of these bugs that are visiting flowers have a whole other life uh, beyond uh, drinking uh, nectar from flowers. And if you don't have those uh, habitat needs taken care of, then those bugs aren't going to be around. So th um, this series of pictures are all uh, bugs that I found on this one meadow sweet plant uh, in the space of half an hour. And I'll just briefly uh, mention what they do in the rest of their lives. So this is a bee in the genus Andrina. They're called mining bees because they burrow into sand to make their nests. And that's they provision their nests with balls of pollen and nectar. And that's where their larvae are. So if, if there's not bare sandy patches around, there won't be these particular kind of bees. This is uh, called a masked or yellow-faced bee, and these nest in abandoned um, borings of <laughs> other bees, like those small carpenter bees in um, hollow sumac stems. Or in this case, this one was in a raspberry cane that we had pruned and left instead of cutting it to the ground. So first a small carpenter bee made its nest in the pith of this cut raspberry stem and then this little yellow-faced bee moved in. Um, this is a, a dance fly whose larvae feed in decomposing leaf litter. So if you rake up and burn all your leaves, you wouldn't have these flies around. This is a square-headed wasp that specializes in hunting flies, and it stuffs them into its nests that are also made in hollow uh, or hollowed out pithy stems like sumac and raspberry. So 
it's good to have a lot of um, cut and dead stems around for things like this to nest in. And then this is a wasp that specializes in parasitizing other wasps that make their nests in hollow stems. So these things all depend on each other. This is a scarab beetle whose larvae develop in rotting wood. So again, if you don't have any dead decomposing things around your yard, you, there are a lot of bugs that won't be there. This is a longhorn beetle whose larvae, uh, most longhorn beetles, um, unlike the one that bores in the roots of sumac, they um, burrow in uh, dead wood. So having dead wood around is important for the larvae of these. And then other insects like this mason wasp make their nests in wood borings of, um, of uh, <laughs> longhorn beetles. And, and, and this, uh, these mason wasps hunt caterpillars and sting them to paralyze them. And then they, um, they're called mason wasps because they use clay to part, or mud to partition their nests. And then this last meadow sweet bug is an adult sawfly which, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some leaf mining sawflies, but most of them have herbivorous larvae that are free living larvae, like this one on a black cherry leaf. And now I see we have about 10 minutes left. I think I'm just talking about three species of tree here, so I think we'll finish on time. <laughs> um, so this um, Sawfly is the sawfly genus Sterictophora always inserts its egg at the edge of a leaf, and then the larvae start out by making these perfect sinusoidal um, feeding patterns for whatever reason. And as they get older, they start to ruin that nice pattern a little bit, and then when they're a little older, they end up just feeding on the leaf edges like a normal caterpillar. Sometimes they bonk heads like that. And uh, most sawflies have a single generation per year, and almost all of them burrow into soil to pupate. But this particular one spun its cocoon on the surface, so I could take a picture of it. But that's what the adult looked like the next year. And this, um, yeah, I, all of the sawflies I raise, I have to keep their little jars of soil over the winter and chill them for a few months so they know that winter has happened. But this was a species that. Um, Dave Smith, who's been studying sawflies at the Smithsonian since the 60s, like Don Davis with his tiny moths. Um, he had named this in 1969, but um, it wasn't known that the larvae make, made those neat little sinusoidal patterns before. Uh, another thing on black cherry leaves are these little snowflake patterns are signs of insects with piercing sucking mouth parts. And if you flip over the leaves, you'll see that there are these lovely little lace bugs, which um, deposit their eggs that look kind of like little bowling pins um, in little clusters on the undersides of the leaves. They glue them down with this tar-like substance. Um, but they're called lace bugs just because of this neat lacy pattern on their wings. Their heads kind of remind me of Darth Vader's helmet. If you take off the outer part, there's that inner thing inside. But Anyway, um, there are a few neat leaf miners on cherry. Um, this, there are maybe five different larvae in this one leaf, um, these little green larvae making squiggly trails. These are some of the smallest moths in the world. They come out and make a cocoon the size of a sesame seed. And the adult is just two millimeters long. I often see these uh, in my office or sometimes in the upstairs bathroom. I think they're so small that they just come through the, the little, just the regular holes in the screens of the windows and then they're attracted to lights. Uh, but another moth that's almost that tiny, maybe two and a half millimeters long, is um, Coptodisca splendoriferella, which is another of these shield-bearing moths uh, that there are a whole bunch of little mines in this one cherry leaf. The whole mine is less than a centimeter long. And the, each larva cut out its own little hole punch. And then here's an example of one that's attached to a tree trunk with a little button of silk uh, where the pupa is riding out the winter. 
Um, we have a few little oak saplings in our yard that were planted by squirrels or um, blue jays, and I can't bear to mow them over. So at some point, we'll have to figure something out because they'll shade out our fruit trees. But in the meantime, they're providing habitat for all kinds of insects, um, including some gall wasps. Um, now, oak is another plant that I could talk for a whole hour about all the things that eat them. There are more caterpillars that feed on oak than on any other plant genus. There are over 150 species of leaf miners on oaks. Um, there are about a thousand species of gall wasps, like this one here, that feed on oaks. And each one um, makes a particular form of gall and a particular part of a particular kind of oak. Um, but I'll just show you two of them that I found on this one sapling in our front yard. Um, this is one that's inserting an egg in a chestnut oak leaf. This was in the Holyoke range somewhere. Um, but these little ones are bursting out of the midrib of an oak leaf in our yard. And then these little f uh, peach fuzz ones. <laughs> so each, each of these little like seed-like things is a individual gall with one larva developing inside of it. And this fuzzy one here, you can see the partitions. There are four different ones that each have one wasp developing in it. Uh, one other thing I'll mention about oak is uh, this thing, which is not a gall, but a leaf roll. That's uh, unlike the other leaf rolls I've showed you uh, that are made with silk. This one has no silk or any other adhesive. It's just made using uh, origami, basically. And it's made by this little red spotted weevil called a leaf rolling weevil that makes two cuts on the leaf that meet um, usually at a vein or the midrib. And then it lays an egg and makes the cylindrical leaf roll around it. And sometimes they leave those hanging there and sometimes they um, bite it off at the base and let it drop to the ground, but their larva develops inside the leaf roll, just uh, feeding on the decaying leaf tissue, and then the adult emerges the following year. There's a related weevil called the thief weevil that lays its eggs in the leaf rolls of other leaf rolling weevils, and its larva eats the egg of the first weevil, and then it gets to eat out that shelter without having to have gone to the trouble of making the roll. So this one was dropped to the ground. I think that weevil saw me watching it and got nervous, so it bit it off instead of leaving it hanging there. Um, and the last tree I'll talk about here is quaking aspen, which is another tree with windborne seeds. So they just come floating in like little milkweed seeds, and we have a few coming up in our yard. Uh, one of the most dazzling of all leaf mines is a uh, an aspen specialist, Philocnistus populiella. And this is what the adult of the moth that makes those mines looks like. And another thing that uh, can be found on both aspen and willow, which are in the same family, is uh, an insect that lays these neat spiky little eggs right at the tip of the leaf and then a uh, caterpillar hatches out and starts munching to either side of the midrib. And then it uh, ties all of its frass on with silk to the end of the midrib. So this is where the midrib actually ends. And all of this here is what's called a frass chain. And um, from what I've read, this is a defense against ants because ants don't want to run out on a poop stick to try to eat a little caterpillar. It's hard to believe that works, but that's the explanation people give for it. Um, but later in the fall, the caterpillar moves to the base of the leaf and starts munching to either side of the midrib down there. And it also starts spinning silk down just like the uh, swallowtail caterpillar does. And that causes it to curl around as it dries and contracts. And then it wraps silk around the petiole and around the stem, just like the spice bush silk moth does, so that this little two centimeter long leaf shelter stays attached to the twig by this little band of silk all winter long. And the caterpillar is just frozen in there waiting for spring. Then it thaws out and it, uh, as it gets bigger, it looks like bird poop. <laughs> it keeps munching away. The chrysalis also looks like bird poop. And then the 
a dope looks like a monarch, but this is a viceroy that's just tricking birds into thinking it's a monarch. Uh, so they won't want to eat it because monarchs are poisonous. So we've come full circle here. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh, Charlie, that was beautiful and fascinating and inspiring. You've given us so many reasons not to mow our lawn. And once your uh, guide to leaf miners come out, we'll have thousands, it sounds like. Um, some people asked a couple of questions uh, where I wanted to start uh, about the space that you're uh, observing in. One question was wondering how much space you need in order to attract native plants and insects. And while you're answering that, if you wouldn't mind um, explaining to people how much you mow your paths and when, what time of year you do that. So I would say that no space is too small. Obviously, the more, the better. But it's amazing the ability of insects to zero in on their one host plant. Like when <clears throat> that um, the, the little tulip tree we planted at the edge of our yard. Um, there is no tulip trees anywhere near here. I mean, there we're up on Crag Mountain. There are some tulip trees in town, I guess, but somehow this tulip tree specialist leaf miner showed up on this little four foot tall tulip tree sapling. So, you know, if you just have one little clump of plants, that's certainly better than nothing and something will find it. <laughs> uh, and as, as for um, mowing, um, the, the part, I mean, the paths and the, the perimeter of our house where we walk regularly, um, I mow, you know, however often is needed so it doesn't get too tall, like maybe every few weeks or last summer I only had to mow a few times because of the drought. But um, in terms of when to mow to avoid um, disrupting the insect, it's kind, kind of hard to answer that because at, at any time someone's life is going to be ruined because in the middle of the summer Obviously, there are things living and, and munching on the plants. And in the winter, there are things overwintering inside the stems of the plants in some cases, or just stuck to the sides. But in general, if you're going to pick one time to mow, it's if you're only mowing once per year, then um, mid-spring, like maybe May or so, like after th there's been a few weeks uh, of warm temperatures for everything that was overwintering to exit the stems and, uh, and move on to their next life state. Uh, that's probably the, the least disruptive. If you have a larger space, you can also just mow different parts at different times. But those are yeah, great. That's really helpful. And, and one follow-up that somebody had to that, um, how, what do you do in order to prevent your whole yard from becoming a forest? Well, eventually, I mean, the parts with um, the, the, the oaks and aspens I've talked about leaving there are, are things I'm selectively leaving, but definitely we are mowing most of the trees that are coming up. So most of the meadow does get mowed once a year. So, so yeah. <laughs> Great. And um, so far, we got one general question about insects, and then I'll follow it up with a specific one that somebody had. What do you recommend as the um, easiest way to identify insects? Well, uh, well, the easiest way is to to post them. To, there's this great website called bugguide.net, and they have an ID request section, and you can um, post your pictures there. And often, someone will tell you exactly what species it is within a few minutes, even in the middle of the night sometimes. And uh, I naturalist can be pretty good too if you're familiar with that. It's a, it's a little more hit or miss because iNaturalist is um, all kinds of life forms, not just insects. So a lot of people who are really specialize on insects hang out on book guide. Um, but, but those are, yeah. And, and then there are all kinds of field guides for insects. But if, if you're really looking for easy, th those are the the easiest ways. And the nice thing about bug guide is that all, every picture that gets submitted to it gets incorporated into a guide. Um, so you can browse through images and there are different 
helpful guide pages to, to guide you through that process. Yeah, very cool. Sounds like a little citizen science. And somebody has a specific question um, about Asclepias tuberosa. Are the orange aphids and ants on milkweed and butterweed, butterfly weed, are they native? Uh, the ants probably are native that you're seeing. The, the orange aphids are not native. That's actually why I left them out of this talk. <laughs> they, um, they, they're called oleander aphids. Oleander is a non-native plant that's in the, the dogbane family, just like uh, milkweed is. And so the, the aphids were able to move on to milkweed from that. But even though they're not native, I mean, some people talk about scraping off or smooshing all the oleander aphids you see. I don't, I, first of all, we haven't had them in our yard for whatever reason. I've just seen these little uh, native aphids on the leaves, um, but I don't feel like they really do much damage um, if they are there. So I, I would tend to just leave them, but they are not native. All right, thank you. Um, how can people get your book, Charlie? The, uh, both of my books are available on my website there, charlieisman.com. Um, there's a page that says, uh, a tab that says publications. So the, the Insect Tracks and Sign book is a physical paperback you can buy, and the, the Leaf Miner one is just a, a, a bunch of PDFs, a, a chapter, a, a different file for each plant family. Um, but yeah, that's how. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for putting it up there on the screen. Um, uh, you might have addressed this at the beginning, uh, but someone might have missed it. Uh, do many of these insects get eaten by birds? Yeah, so um, yeah, yes. I mean, the, the bugs I've talked about for, as a whole, for sure. Um, leaf miners, are, some of these things are so tiny that it's more like they're eaten by other insects that are then eaten by birds. But even some of the leaf miners, like um, people have seen chickadees tearing open leaf mines to eat out the caterpillars inside. So it does happen. Great, that is all the questions we have, Charlie. I don't know if uh, you've been able to check out the chat, but people are super impressed and grateful. So thank you so much for putting it all out there. I really want to thank uh, First Light Powers, Northfield Mountain Recreation and Environmental Center, also for helping put this on, along with, uh, of course, the initiators of it, the Northfield Bird Club. We are super happy to and lucky to have you in the area, Charlie. Thanks so much for sharing this with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs> have a great evening, everybody. Let us know at the library if you want to see any particular kinds of events. We'd love to put them on for you. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Fantastic. How do I do that?